I'm absolutely tickled pink that uh, my good friend uh, Malin V6VID uh, is here to join me tonight. He is the local expert uh, on uh, light, super lightweight uh, portable uh, antenna options. Um, and he's uh, uh, the, the second guy in, in Alberta to get mountain goat status. So uh, all of what we're talking about tonight, he and I, um, it's not from a theoretical perspective, it's just all based on practical experience from climbing, uh, well, I guess in both our cases, well over 200 uh, summits over the years and trying all kinds of different uh, uh, bands and, and modes. So I'll try to share the screen now. I'll ask uh, Jerry if someone is uh, waving their hand or saying something in the chat, I may not be able to see it. So you'll just have to uh, interrupt me and then if uh, we can squeeze in a question, but there should be time at the end too. And I want to give you as much time as possible, especially to, to pick Malin's brains, but I'm going to do a bit of an introduction and scene set and talk about one kind of base basic type of antenna and then turn it over to Malin. So here we go. The, there's been interest in uh, portable, not even requiring a vehicle, uh, ham radio setups or radio setups for a very long time, as this picture illustrates from well over 100 years ago. I kind of like the sentiment here. It's an interesting uh, sort of a, a loop antenna uh, that the fellow's got strapped to his back. I'm not sure I'd want to climb up a Soto Summit on this one, but it, it shows that the, uh, the ambition to uh, go places on foot uh, with uh, with radio gear has been around for a very long time. So what we're going to do today is uh, just do a, a quick overview of antenna options and especially the trade-offs that go with different options for super lightweight portable ops. Uh, so we'll apologize in advance if we're you know slagging your favorite design or not <laughs> sufficiently extolling your favorite design. Uh, because, you know, there's, there's preferences and there always will be. There is no silver bullet, you know, one antenna is the perfect one for these kinds of operations, uh, as will be illustrated during the talk and won't come as a surprise to anyone, I'm sure. Uh, so we're just going to talk a little bit about the pros and cons of each, of each type. The main focus uh, will be kind of super lightweight for soda. Obviously, anything that would work for soda will work just fine for POTA as well parks on the air, although there's a good deal uh, of a number of options that will become viable for, for POTA that maybe wouldn't be for soda. There's kind of two kinds of, of POTA, right? There's hardcore, you know, climbing way up or being on a remote uh, national park or something versus, you know, drive down to Fish Creek Park and the picnic table is 10 steps from the car. I mean, you know, if you want to, you can get your vacuum tube boat anchor and haul it over and Pretty much any antenna option is fine too if you can uh, find room but that's not what we're talking about and we're not talking about you know go boxes and so on this is we're talking any option where uh, the main consideration is one of or considerations are ones of weight and bulk and there can be other issues as well that, that simply preclude the, the kind of options that would be perfectly okay for vehicle accessible locations like the go box kind of scenario is usually associated with you know being vehicle born at some point in its in its journey. Although certainly some of what we're talking about a super light soda pack could also be uh, a kind of a go box of sorts. Um, so we're looking at low power re requirements uh, in terms of the input, you know, battery power and so on. And, uh, and fairly low output requirements as well. I'm gonna do, we're gonna mainly focus on HF. We will talk a little bit at the end about VHF, UHF, microwave. Uh, the reason for spending so much time on HF is it just kind of gets easier to make a lightweight portable antenna the higher up you go in frequency, right? So a bunch of options become viable to stick in your backpack, you know, at uh, 1296 megahertz that aren't that much fun at 80, meters. So the main differences from other contexts are that, you know, you got to be able to basically carry this by what, what we call LPC, leather personnel carrier. So you want to be able to haul this thing on foot, no vehicle required. And uh, in addition to that, uh, our criteria often require that we're operating in rugged, obstructed, and non-level areas. And given the nature of, you know, the wilderness in general, not just in Alberta, but maybe especially in Alberta, there's exposure to wind. 
which is quite an issue when you're putting up antennas. So there's an interesting picture there on the left of Malin uh, posing on the top of Windy Hill, which is uh, not that far south, southwest of Calgary, and it's uh, named that for a good reason. And that's not even a particularly windy day on Windy Hill, but it'll give you some idea of, the, of what the kind of criteria are that we're, we're looking at here. So a lot of the, the criteria that you would use when trying to decide on an antenna or buy an antenna are exactly the same in this super white, uh, super lightweight realm as they would be if you were, you know, looking at making or buying an antenna for your home shack or your mobile. The only thing that's different is certain of the criteria become far more important. So, you know, things like cost and what band mode power requirements, you know, the difficulty of construction or repair, reliability, all those kinds of issues are the same ones you'd be thinking of if you were going down to Radio World to get something to stick up on the chimney of your house or attach it to your truck. But when you're in the realm of soda and poda, weight and bulk and also the shape factor get elevated far, far up the list. Also ease of deployment, you know, you have to usually do things fairly quickly and without a lot of fussing and you have to consider the possibility that you might be doing it in wind, you might be doing it in cold air. And another one is the operating footprint. Uh, you know, the size of the available real estate also is an issue, of course, at home, you know, you probably don't have a big enough backyard to string an 80 meter dipole. Well, in soda and some poda, it, it's a, a very major consideration just how much uh, hilltop or, or park real estate you think you're going to have in order to spread out an antenna. So without belaboring that, like I said, similar criteria, maybe just the weights change a bit. And before I get on to talking about some of the specific pros and cons, um, I'll say that, uh, hang on a sec, oops. Just, uh, that uh, one of the issues that we'll be talking about is how important it is to have multi-band capability. And there's no doubt that it's certainly handy to be able to switch and, and work a few different bands. But one of the things that we've learned, I guess, through painful experience in the soda realm is you gotta be careful about trading too much weight, bulk, shape factor, some of those higher priority criteria that I just mentioned for getting multi, multi, multi-band capability. Uh, I kind of worry, you know, you see things advertised for, for big bucks on websites and so on that'll work everything as allegedly as a backpackable portable antenna and it'll, it'll work everything from, you know, 160 meters to, to daylight. But you have to ask yourself, do you really need that many bands and is it worth trading off some of the other things you're gonna be trading off? Most remote portable ops take place in daylight. So, you know, 160, 80 meters, not the greatest bands for them. Even 40 kind of can be so-so in daylight. So, you know, you maybe don't need those lower bands for the lightweight portable world like you might like to have in the evening in your home shack. Uh, also just, you know, depending on what kind of operating you intend to do, where are the listeners? Uh, soda chasers for the last six years that I've been doing it have all been on 40 meters, 30 for CW, 20 and 17 and then, you know, VHF and up. Now, with the sunspot cycle on its way up, it's going to get better, and I can hardly wait to do some 15, 10, 12 meter kind of stuff on hilltops, uh, and there will be more chasers there, but so far, you know, it's been, you know, two or three bands is the most that we've ever needed to work on a hilltop. Usually even just two is lots, and one of the reasons for that is your loiter time, as I call it, is inherently limited in wilderness just because of weather. I mean, even in fairly benign summer days, a lot of our foothills around here, you know, you're in the wind and you get cold pretty quick if you're not moving. And so you really don't have time or finger dexterity to be messing around, you know, and, and working people on five or six different vans. Poda can be a bit different. I mean, you can set up on a nice comfortable picnic table under some shelter, you know, and, and operate all day and then, you know, more power to you. But our typical soda trip, you know, we drive two hours, hike two hours, set up in 10 minutes and operate for maybe 30 at most. How many vans are you going to be able to work? So the types of antennas we're going to discuss, uh, and there could be others, there are others that have been used in portable ops and, and soda and poda, but just in the interest of time and sticking to the, uh, 
the, the main types here. Um, I'm going to start with dipoles. You know how radio theory books and antenna theory books always start with the reference dipole. And then you kind of go on to there and explain how other things are variants of dipoles. So we'll start with dipoles as well, because they are perfectly viable. At least the particular type of dipole is perfectly viable for these kind of ops. Then we'll spend, I hope, a good lot of amount of time on end fed half waves. And you've got Malin on here, and he's an expert on this stuff and builds beautiful end fed half waves that a lot of the soda guys are using. Uh, end fed long wire, random wire, kind of a variation on that same thing. And then fairly quickly, we'll talk about the pros and cons of verticals and loops. And then uh, spend a little bit of time talking about commercially manufactured options versus homebrew and wind up with how much easier the world gets when the frequency goes up and you start playing with VHF, UHF, microwave, etc. So just uh, Jerry thought it would be good just to put up a couple of little stick man diagrams here for any of the new hams to give you some idea of the first uh, four types we're going to discuss what they look like in terms of shape. So in portable ops, it's pretty hard to string a dipole out in a horizontal fashion because you need to like climb two trees or take two poles or something like that. But you can use an inverted V configuration where you've just got a single pole, which can be supported in various ways that we'll talk about. And then the antenna wires kind of string out in an upside down V. Uh, they don't go right to the ground. You, you then attach the, the last length is just cord and then you can uh, guide them down with tent pegs and so on. Then there's the in-fed half wave or the in-fed long wires. Uh, they have some advantages we'll talk about in terms of putting up, but again, you need some kind of a, a high support at one end usually, although I've seen Malin just string it along a series of tree branches just six feet off the ground. But typically they're, uh, you know, an inverted V, inverted L, uh, that kind of thing, or a sloper, like this picture just shows, you know, your regular kind of sloper design. And then there's verticals that uh, where the, the antenna is the pole, if you will, or is part of the pole or is attached to the pole and goes straight up with some kind of a stand and very typically some kind of a radial system sticking out the bottom to improve the ground. And then there's loops, which don't necessarily have to be round like this picture. They can be, you know, square and diagonal and so on. But uh, just to give you an idea of what we mean by these different types. So inverted V, let's just start with the basic reference dipole. There's an inverted V sitting on top of a, uh, a hill out on the way to Canmore. It's called the, uh, the rim wall. And as you can see, you get a pretty decent view up there. And it's just a uh, fiberglass extension pole uh, to, as the support. And it's uh, because there's no trees there, or fence posts to bungee it to or something, there's little guy wires that are supporting it uh, to keep it uh, from blowing down in the wind. And then the uh, two legs of the antenna and a little feed line coming down roughly close to the pole. And, and that's uh, about all there is to it. Um, this is one that I home brewed, and this is by no means as light as they can get at 200 grams. Malin is the grand champion of the universe at brewing stuff, not only dipoles, but a lot of other types that are even lighter than this. Uh, but just to give you an idea that you really don't need a lot of exotic kit to do uh, portable lightweight ops. I've talked to a guy in New Zealand several times on this thing. And I've talked to a guy in France lots and lots of times on this thing. And all it is is just, you know, a, a little uh, BNC connector, you know, with a little protector on it and a couple of wires soldered on the end. And, uh, and uh, the wire is on a couple of plastic wire winders that I, I bought from Soda Beams, although you can certainly brew your own, especially if you have a 3D printer or a friend who does. And then there's a high visibility guying cord at the end of the wires. And it's got some links, which I'll talk about, so that it can work both the 17 meter band and the 20 meter band. Pretty simple and very, very light. And uh, you can stuff it in a little mesh bag and stick it in your backpack and away you go. So uh, not, not too much to it, but that's kind of the basic starting point for a lot of these things. <clears throat> you can also buy them if you don't feel like home brewing. Uh, there's a company called Sota Beans uh, based out of the United Kingdom, and they have all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, the, the wire winders, these plastic thingies that the wires are wrapped on, 
uh, is one of their products and uh, it, they work like really well and they've got different sizes. That's the largest size, but they've got, you know, medium size ones and mini size ones. And they also sell the good antenna wire and good high vis cord and plastic do for Johns to use as antenna centers and ship it to you in a nice little cloth bag and you even get the tent pegs. So uh, not that expensive. Uh, the killer uh, with stuff from the UK is actually mailing costs, not not the price of the stuff on the website, but you can certainly homebrew the stuff or source things from the United States as well or other places. So I won't get into reading all these things in fine detail. Like I said, it's mainly there sort of as a page turner later, but each of these antennas, there's a slide that talks about the good news and the bad news. Okay, so, you know, obviously, like I said, there are, these ones are light, small, easy to make, easy to fix. If you want it to be multi-banded, you just put some little plug links or clips that enable you to uh, electrically connect or disconnect two different sections. And if you cut these things to approximate resonance in each section, you do not need a tuner. And if they're cut to resonance, you don't need a ballon either. So this thingy here, no tuner, no ballon. So less weight, less bulk to haul up a hill, just, just the antenna. Now it's somewhat limited because it only works in the resonant portion of the 20 meter band and phone portion of the 20 meter band and the phone portion is 17, but it works fine within those constraints. And that's all I got time for on the top of a soda hill anyway. Um, inverted Vs are good for sort of a, a mix of horizontal and vertical polarization. And you, you're, I get really good signal reports with these things. So, you know, they're, they're pretty, uh, you know, dipoles have got a long history and they're pretty unexotic, but they're pretty damn effective uh, and, and low loss. It can be if you get them nicely resonant. So low power, but good signal reports. So uh, that's a, a picture of a, of a, a inverted V dipole designer, which is a lead pipe cinch simple design tool that's on the, one of the SOTA websites. You see the reference there, sodamaps.org, and you just put in how many sections you want. I have a two bander or a three bander or just a one bander, and how long your pole is and how long the, uh, the cord at the bottom should be. And it'll tell you about how long each section of wire should be. And then you just put the clips between the sections, right? And uh, you can also buy uh, kits that have uh, traps on them if you don't want to use the link approach or you want to maybe enable some slightly lower bands. So uh, Malin put a, a thing on there for a trap kit. And there's many, many other options you can search out on the net as well. So there's a couple of pictures there. Uh, that's uh, on the far upper left. That's an example of the center of a, of a, of a bot uh, soda beams antenna. And they have a certain kind of a plastic uh, antenna center. Uh, there's a little uh, uh, toroid there. I mean, a, a little uh, choke, uh, ferrite choke there uh, just to keep the feed line from radiating, but it's not very heavy and you really don't even need that. But that's kind of what the centers look like. And then if you want to make them multi-banded, you just put in little plastic or wooden uh, insulators between the sections, and then you connect them up with either banana clips or alligator clips or something that will make an electrical connection. And uh, you can even uh, use these links and clips to do minor amount of trimming by instead of letting the links hang straight down when one is disconnected, you can hook it back on its own length of antenna wire. As you see there, you can trim it slightly lower by, you know, going over a little further to the, the left and trim it slightly higher by going to the right. Pr pretty primitive compared to, a, you know, carrying a tuner, but it works. So the bad news is to use an inverted V dipole, you need a fairly high center. So we typically use some kind of a fiberglass or in some cases, carbon fiber or something like that, but extension pole. And uh, you either have to uh, support that with a, a cord or Velcro strap or just lean it against a tree or a fence post or a bungee cord, something like that. But if there's a, a bare hilltop, then you end up having to put a, a guying system in. And I've got a, a picture of that coming up in a minute. So there's a couple options there. On the right hand, there's just sort of a, an example of th what hangs around in Malin's closet. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the ones you can get over the internet for fishing work just great for this. Uh, and you can just put a little clip on the end of them and 
they're nice and light and uh, very inexpensive. Uh, if you want something really sturdy for high wind, that one on the left there, the, the tactical mini from Soda Beams is just built like a tank and, and will put up uh, incredible amounts of wind, but you do need a pole. And uh, the thing about poles is, you know, and guying, there's a guying kit on the left there. It's, it's really easy and good wind and or, or good weather, low wind, and especially if you got a helper to hold the pole up, otherwise you have to lay the pole down, put, you know, lay out on the ground, the guy wires, and gradually pull the pole until two of the wires are tight, and then peg down the third one, and so on. It's a bit finicky doing it by yourself, especially in a high wind. So that's probably the number one disadvantage of the uh, of the inverted V, but there's an example of it when it's at its best. Uh, Malin and his uh, niece up on the, uh, I forget, I think that was Volcano Ridge, wasn't that Malin? Pretty sure. All right, so. Yeah, it, it was kind of, it was Volcano Ridge the first time we went there. Yeah, lovely day. And so beautiful uh, day for it. And you got time to set up a, a, an inverted V, away you go. They do take longer to set up than NFEDs. You need a longer wire than you do with an NFED. And by definition, longer wire means it's harder to deploy in a cramped, heavily treed, bushy area around obstacles, rocks, whatever. So it's just inherently less practical than NFEDs. And the longer, you know, the, uh, the uh, wavelength, the, uh, the lower the frequency, the, uh, the worse it is for using up a lot of real estate. Uh, and you do need a longer feed line because it's, you know, the center is up the pole. So the feed line's got to run down the pole, whereas with an NFED, you can have the feed line at the low end. You do need to uh, think a little bit about inclusion angle. I don't know if, whoops, sorry, we went the wrong way. Um, if, you, if you look at uh, where the antenna is coming off the top here, uh, the, the yellow thing is just the guy line, but the antennas are, are steeper there. You do want uh, to not have too flat or too steep an inclusion angle. That's, that's one of the tricks with these inverted Vs. And of course that can just add to the amount of you know, distance that you're gonna have to use up on the ground or the size of the operating area. Hey Ken, uh, yeah. question, uh, how tall are your central center uh, poles typically? Okay, they, uh, they all have come in sections. So one of the neat things about that, you just twist this, each section to tighten it down. So depending on the hill and in your antenna, you can use one pole and just not use all the sections. Just leave a few of the top ones collapsed inside the pole or you can go to like full length. But typically we go, I mean, Malin's done it with, you know, an avalanche pro, like six feet tall. Uh, but I've got one soda pole that goes up about, uh, about 20 feet. Um, so I'd say that's probably your, your inner and outer limits. Much taller than 20 gets to be quite a, a lot of wind shear. But, you know, uh, 12, 15, 18 feet, you know, it's fine. Malin, you got anything to add there? I, my height, I like my poles are is about 16 feet, 5 meters is about the best. And uh, I've had quite a bit of luck with it if I ever do use a, a mast anymore. So, uh, and now I'm gonna turn it over to Malin with just the last comment. This is one of my pride and joy. This is a, a, an antenna that Malin made for me. Again, just using a soda beams wire winder and, and the type of wire that they use. But he home brewed the whole thing. And this is an in-fed half wave that will clip to a soda pole, deploy in amazing time, put up with a lot of wind and it'll work, let's see, 40, 20, uh, 15, 10 and 17 with the link undone. Is that right, Malin? Have I got them all? Yeah, that is correct. Uh, with the tuner, you can tune uh, 40, 30, and all the other uh, 17, 12, uh, 17, 12 uh, uh, bands as well. Right. So you can see how amazing that capability is for such a, a small machine. And I haven't weighed this one, but it doesn't weigh much. That's for sure. It's easy to backpack and it's very robust. I've knock the uh, transformer box around a few times. So I'm just gonna go to the next slide and then let you take it away and explain how these things are built. Okay, this slide here, the, those are four of my, uh, um, well, actually I'm down to two of the four now, go-tos. The one in the bottom right is the one I use for my amplifier. Um, it's a MXP50, so it's about 40 watts output on sideband. Um, same box as Ken, but without the 
the link for 17. The one above it is actually, I just had it, is right here. I don't know if you can see it. That's with the box open with the toroid and the, uh, the, the um, capacitor inside it. Um, that does 40 to 10, everything in between, and 80 if the antenna is up high. Uh, what you see now on the left is a uh, FT50-43, uh, 49 to 1, mounted on a BNC connector. So that would go right on the side of your radio, and, and the uh, wire would go up from there. Uh, and the center shot is a um, basically a micro trap. It's sitting on a dime, so that just shows you how small it is. Again, it's an FT, or excuse me, an, um, a T50-2. On the right is basically mine and Ken's box that's open that we use for, uh, for our amplifiers. That's an FT114-43 with a 21 to three uh, ratio and a, about a three kilovolt, 100 uh, picofarad uh, capacitor. Now the the infids like deploying the infids, um, you could buy commercial ones, and I I've actually used a commercial one. I I didn't like it because most of them have a shortening like a, a coil in the center to shorten the length, and that coils a lot of weight, so it it you know it takes a lot more work to keep it up. Um, configurations, my uh, as Ken said, my configurations is basically um, like an inverted L type of thing, even six feet high. Um, Jesse, VE6 Juliet Tango Whiskey, who's just gone to CW, he, uh, he operates his NFED uh, off his hiking pole. So they're only four feet in the air. And he, you know, Europe, all of North America on CW, uh, five watts. Um, inverted V, the NFED works very well with the inverted V, uh, inverted L sloper. A sloper does have a, a marginal gain in the direction of the slope. So if you're having it sloped from the feet point to the, to the top uh, towards the south, you'll have a small gain in that direction. Um, I find it really easy, like deploying the dipole, I could be 10, 15 minutes setting up. I think my fastest time after hitting a summit and getting on the air was about three to four minutes after uh, after deploying the infed. Um, as you know, you can throw it. I've used my even my bear spray on one stomach. I forgot my uh, my <laughs> multi tool, so I ended up putting my bear spray on. I went through the trees. It went like a missile, but it worked very well. I just went over, took my bear spray off afterwards, and it was uh, good to go. So there's a couple other options you can see there for things to throw over tree branches. Uh, but any kind of a weight will do, as, as Malin says. And he did mention uh, that using a hiking pole as one end as the support pole, or it could either be the low end of a, of a sloper that's strung from a high pole or tree branch, or it can just be the only pole. I don't know how well you can see it in that picture, but that's me sitting down with the hiking pole and the, uh, the transformers just uh, strapped to the, the pole there. And then the feed line, really short one, just runs down onto the radio from there. A lot of my, a lot of my infids, I actually uh, put a male BNC connector. I don't know if you can see it male BNC connector on it. Um, Can you see the, my, my mouse? Yeah, that's, that's a female, but- Oh, up, sorry, there's a, uh, okay, there's one, yeah, that's a female, sorry. There is, oh, wait a sec, there, there we The go. upper two yeah, are, the upper are two. male BNC, so they actually connect right onto the side of the radio. Uh, no counterpoise, no feed line, and they it, very good results with the KX2, KX3, uh, the G90, and, and the 817. Is there a magic length to that wire? You, you have to tune it for the highest frequency. So if you plan to go for like a, a 40 to 10 NFED, you tune it to 40. I prefer to tune it around 7.185 uh, uh, because that's basically mid band for, for 40 meters. And for the most part, it would be upper portion, the voice portion of... Uh, of 20, 15, and it's the lower sideband portion for 10 as well. And where do you tune them? At home or when you're out there? 
I do a rough tune at home. Um, like I, I've made, I bet you 50 in the last two years. And, and I give them away to people like uh, a couple of guys down the States, uh, YouTubers have them. And, uh, I, I do a rough tune at home that I take them up and actually deploy them. I take my, uh, my, uh, rig expert AA 230 up with me to actually tune them on a summit just to confirm it. Yeah. One of the issues around here is something that you tune up on your nice moist lawn you get up on a soda hill where it's all dry and rocky. It's uh, you really get to understand how what a difference ground makes. Yeah, Malin, what size of transformers have you found uh, to be uh, adequate, like for the uh, twenty watt level, and uh, and a big one with the uh, FT two forty three size? Uh, have you ever run that at a hundred watts? I've actually uh, I've used the FT one one four dash forty three for. Uh, for 100 watts for a short period of time, it did get warm. I ended up uh, peeling my, you know, dialing my back my power. Um, I found the FT, uh, even though FT 140 size uh, is good for the casual uh, or short, very short spurt. Um, I would only do maybe 25 watts digital through it. I'm not, you know, I've I've done a digital FT8 activation, and this wasn't me. You know, sitting in a snowbank in February, trying to you know wait for my laptop to do all the work, so it wasn't my thing. Um, I find you know for for a rag chew, the FT two forty uh, is the perfect size. You never it, really it, want to haul that much. Uh, you know, it's very rare to be running hundred watts on a soda hill. Nobody wants to haul the battery that's needed. I I know personally myself, like I. Once I took up my uh, ICOM 7000, ran 100 watts, but I did it in a trapped dipole, which is linked uh, further on in the uh, in the presentation. But it did very well for 20 and 40 at 100 watts at about 18 feet at the feet point. When you um, when you look for a place to put your antenna, do you look for a part of the hill that's sloping down steeply, or do you look for uh, aiming it at a certain direction, like towards Japan, or how would you go about positioning your antenna? Well, with, within the SOTA rules, we have to be within 25 meters vertically of the summit of the high point. So a lot of times um, I go for towards the lee side of the hill, get out, try to get out of the wind. Um, just even a couple of meters over that lee side, I don't really pay attention to which direction. I know with the infis, they uh, they radiate off the sides more than um, off the ends. I've had you know really good, uh, a very common chaser out of California said I found the best I ever did with uh, you know I had my radio dot turned down to five watts and he, that was more sounded better than a uh, with my amplifier on. So that one of the nice things about HF right is you know with Faraday rotation and all that you know. It, it, most of these HF activations we do are relatively insensitive to which exact direction you lay out the wire. I, I tend to try to lay out the wire so it's broadsiding somewhat to the south and east where more of the chasers are in the US, but it's really not critical. Of course, later on we talk about, you know, microwave or something, then it's a whole other animal, right? You've got to have it pointed exactly at the recipient in a line of sight, unobstructed way. And where I have a tendency, if Ken's going east west, I have a tendency to go north south on the same uh, activation because we're in fairly close uh, to each other. So we're trying to get the antennas uh, perpendicular to each other, but they still work very, uh, very well. <laughs> so maybe we should uh, briefly mention the cons of NFEDs. I mean, you do need a tuner. And preferably you, you have one built in like the ones Malin just showed you, or if you're just, uh, you know, wanting to carry a random wire or not build all that gear, then you need to take the trade off of packing a tuner. And it's probably not the little trimming type tuner that is built into a lot of radios. It's one that can handle fairly serious SWR excursions. And those tend to be a bit bulkier and heavier. The, uh, um, Using a 49 to 1 um, transformer, you, you're still looking at about a 24, 2500 uh, um, ohm at, 
uh, impedance at the end at the feed point. So you need, uh, you know, you need, you definitely need that uh, 49 to one to get it down. You can get it away from uh, um, using a tuner. Like, my, like I, most of the times now with my KX2, I rarely hit tune. I just go ahead and operate and it works out very well. Uh, you know, Ken, he mentions about, you know, get the antenna getting hung up on, uh, on trees, I've had a um, bad spell there last year. I went through three of the uh, Cabela's multi-tools and, and three activations because it had come unclipped off of my uh, wire. I ended up tossing it over the edge or tossing it in the woods and then I have to try to redo the whole thing over again and try to get it up in the air. And I've had to climb trees several times to uh, fetch uh, bits of antenna or the whole thing down. Um, the Cabela's things are great because they, they are a weight, but also double as a repair tool. But I kind of gave up on those because the shape of them is a bit more prone to snagging on an evergreen. So right now I've got a, an arborist throw weight, which is just a little of more slithery, but isn't very good for doing in-field repairs. Try that small water bottle, Ken. It's, uh, you know, the really small ones, they're great. Uh, you just drop the string under the water bottle and when, when you're finished with it, you can pour the weight out on the ground. All right, that's fair, yeah. Someone asked if we are, if, when we are together or when, on different bands, uh, yes. Uh, Ken's the, uh, the guru for 17 meters. I, uh, I'll hit 20 and 40 and, and Ken will bounce around to 20 once in a blue moon, but. Generally speaking, Ken's on 17 and I'm normally on 20. One uh, of the things we have to try to do on Soda Summits where there's more than one activator, because we've had as many as three or even four, is to not QRM each other. So you do a little bit of a coordination discussion. Okay, Malin, are you going to start on 20 today? Okay, good. I'll start on 17. And then if I can't get enough contacts, you know, after you're done on 20, I'll switch to 20 or that kind of thing. Anything else about infed halfways? Questions, comments? Uh, they really are our favorites among the active activators, I would say, for, you know, even though they have a few trade offs, they're, they're excellent. Do you, um, I, do you ever bother with a ground plane? Or with a, a, gr a counter, a counter voice? See, uh, th there's two schools of thought for counter poises when it comes to uh, infeds. Um, but if you look, actually look at the um, design of a infed with a counterpoise, um, that counterpoise is actually calculated into the, the formula for getting the length of the wire. Um, and they use a, a transformer where the, the infeds that I make use an auto transformer. So basically at the most, you need two meters of, uh, of RG58 um, or for QRP levels, just uh, you know, race straight to the rate itself. So that's so. my ground, that's my counterpoise right there. Like the antenna wire runs to the transformer. There's a little piece of, oh gosh, it must only be about five feet long feed line, RG58 or something to the radio. And I sometimes deliberately sort of let that string along the ground a little bit before it goes into the radio. And I can notice the difference if it's high up versus if it's in contact with the ground. It's like a, oh, a rat tail on an HD. Kinda. What I prefer to use instead of a uh, counterpoise is actually, um, I take a, like a tent peg with a, a short chunk of wire and an and a alligator clip. And I just make like ground out the antenna someplace uh, or ground out my radio to the ground. And, and that is more uh, productive and effective and faster up on the summit. So we should probably leave people offline if they want to really get into the technical details of how to build these and uh, and talk to the expert when, when he's available. Uh, we should probably move on. Uh, there's some, uh, a few uh, places uh, here, uh, links uh, that you can check. Uh, there's always good stuff on the, on the soda reflector about different antennas, not just NFEDs that people have tried and they put their pictures up proudly and tell them, tell people how they work. But there's some other sites here where you can look at NFEDs and how they can be home brewed. Uh, they can also be purchased, of course. And we we'll talk about that a bit the, in a second. That top link is actually a, a presentation from a, a very knowledgeable person when it comes to NFED half waves and design. And, uh, I've actually gone away from the, I guess they call them non-standard uh, toroids. I, they're all type 43, but they're not the normal like uh, 
FT140, FT114, whatever. They're uh, more different, taller than most of them. Um, the second one is just a, uh, a soda one. And the third one is actually a video from uh, Adam K6ARK, where he's, he's the one that uh, um, came up with the FT50-43 on a mounted on a BNC connector. So that's uh, his video. And, you know, it's, it's a good watch. So we encourage you to look at those on your own time. Um, we won't spend a long time on, on in-fed long wire, random wire. I mean, it's kind of a variation on the, the theme we just talked about with in-fed half wave. Similar advantages and disadvantages in terms of easier to deploy than a dipole by a country mile. Uh, but uh, you're always going to need to deal with the tuning issue, obviously. And typically these tuners need to handle large SWR excursions. And, uh, you know, they'll need to accept whatever power loss goes with that. Okay. Question, have you ever, uh, either of you ever tested or compared two different types of antennas from the same location to see how well they fared? Yeah, there's uh, Ian uh, V6IXD, Alberta's first goat, uh, loves to play with these uh, uh, little, uh, uh, oh, Malin, Whisper. help me, Whisper. Whisper, the Whisper lights. And so you can, you can uh, synchronously start two Whisper transmitters on, on a couple of antennas and compare the signal to noise ratios as well as the distances that you're reaching and how many contacts. And uh, we've done that both uh, comparing antennas head to head from home, but even on Soda Hills. One day, I think, Malin, you were with me, weren't you? We went up on top of uh, one of the hills up near Sundry there, uh, Tay or something like that, and, and set up an antenna and just let her run. Uh, while the other guys were on radiant and then uh, switched hills and exchanged with the other guys and let them collect it. So it had a, a, about an hour or two to run and we got a big database of which antenna was doing better. It, what I found with our random wire, random wire is not really random at all. It's, it's actually, there's a chart with specific links because you can't be, you know, half or a quarter wave or even one eighth wave, uh, um, resonant on any frequency so it, it becomes a bit of a, uh, a head scratcher shall we say for trying to get the right length of random wire i did try it i, I thought it would be a, a good antenna for soda but it just wasn't good enough that's uh, interesting malin because uh, uh you know if you have something like a kx2 or kx3 with the excellent tuners they have um uh basically uh you know the the losses of course are going to be lower than the loss in the n-fed matching transformer and uh you know you kind of wonder if uh you know why uh why that standard 28 foot length uh, i've heard people say that's uh, you know actually one of the best antennas they've used uh, on the kx3 and uh so uh, it's interesting to hear your experience. And I'm not surprised, uh, you know, years ago, I was uh, using uh, just kind of quasi random wire antennas, uh, uh, you know, and, and with, a, with a home boot tuner and never had very good results. The dipole was always better. It, it, they always tuned very well. Um, like the random wire tuned well, but I just didn't get the results for contacts. Hmm. So I actually got skunked. I got three, three contacts on the hill. I was calling for about a half hour to try to get the fourth. And I just never got the fourth contact. So to, to me, that is, is the non-producing, you know, it would might work um, in other locales, but not, not up here, I don't think. Yeah, that's uh, it's it's interesting, and the of course these uh, these uh, N-fed long wires uh, use a transmission line transformer, which is a much lower loss. Um, so technically, they should be a lot more efficient, uh, you know, if you're going to go that way. But uh, that's uh, that's kind of the experience and kind of thing that I've heard from other people too. So uh, I, I've uh, uh, one other question, Malin. Uh, how do you know whether an antenna is working when you're uh, when you're up there? Uh, you know, you've had this experience, and and uh, you get that feeling. How do you know it's just not a dead band? Well, uh, we we actually post up on a website that we're on this frequency. On this uh, on this summit, and there's a uh, people called chasers, and they'll actively chase you um, quite often from France. I've talked to France. I've talked to you know 
the, the one day a year and a half ago on uh, Square Butte, just over in South McLean Creek area. Uh, within 24 minutes, I had about 30 contacts and about eight of those were into Europe. And it is was... possible to get dead air and then right away you start looking to see if something's wrong because usually we get somebody fairly quick but you can i get the dead band phenomenon sometimes on 17 at the bottom of the sunspot cycle because it would only come alive at about two o'clock in the afternoon and i was trying it you know 1 30 in the afternoon kind of thing but uh yeah, most of the time you you can kind of tell that something's broken or it's working within i don't know two or three minutes worth of calling cq so right. you, you you get to know fairly quick if if the band is open or not, and also too with with that uh, that website that uh, where we put our uh, spots up on, you can just tell by the number of spots and and what bands are on, and which band is open. So it's it's you know it's good for us to get contacts, but also too to see what's going on as well. So well, you've got an internet connection. I do most. You won't believe where you get where you get. Uh, you know, four bars of, of uh, cell plus full data. Like as soon as you get up, you know, height is might and it works very well with our, uh, our my phone as well. And even if you don't have a data connection, if you've got just uh, SMS, cell phone, bare bones, one, you know, bar, you can send a, a properly formatted SMS text message to a SOTA phone number. And it'll pop it up on the internet as, hey, V6VID is currently operating on 20 meters on, you know, this hill, Square View. And so people can chase you. I, uh, same, same thing. I have an in reach and I use that for spotting as well, like in uh, um, Parker Ridge up in, uh, you know, up in the mountains. No cell phone, no nothing. And I get my spots out and it works very well. All right, we should probably move on now to a couple other types, which we won't spend as much time on. Uh, uh, we haven't used them as much, although all of these types have been used by some of us on soda trips and uh, are used by others for, for soda purposes. None of these are, are my pictures. They're just various random, you know, pictures of different types of verticals stolen off the internet. Um, but uh, you can pretty much by just thinking about the shape of them versus the inverted V's and the and the uh, the end feds and so on. What some of the you know the virtues and vices are of something that sort of uh, go, runs straight up its own pole with just a guiding system, or a lot of them maybe are supported on on a little tripod type device or something like that. There's the you know the well known J pole, buddy pole, etc. Type design and all kinds of other. Um, verticals as well and they have their virtues not the least of which is they're sure easy to put up a lot of time most of the types are uh, often without even the need for a guiding system if it's sitting on a tripod and uh, you know omnidirectional vertical polarization very small footprint right you don't use up much real estate at all so you know there's some good things about them but there's some good reasons why we haven't used them a lot Malin, you use verticals more often than than i do uh, well I, I experimented uh um like with a buddy stick a buddy pole both are too finicky i uh, experimented with the alpha antennas call it tactical it, it's a five to one on on basically matching a, um a 13 foot mast or a 13 foot radiator it worked okay, but still uh, finicky, and it took time to set up up on the up on the summit. So, yeah, and they are kind of prone to be blown over in the wind. Uh, not if you've got a really big guying system, but if you've got that, you know, you might as well just put up a, an inverted V or an N fed as well. So if you're just going to stick it up on a tripod, you kind of need to wait to hang a sandbag from it. I actually do do that when I put microwave gear up on a on a tripod to make sure it doesn't get blown down in the wind as you hang a little mesh bag with some, some something heavy in it to keep the tripod from getting blown over. So, you know, there's, there's some nice things about verticals, especially the low amount of real estate, but they don't tend, I, I guess I'd say to be much in favor among the Alberta uh, soda crowd. Uh, anything you want to add to that, Malin? Um, Like my experience, like, 
you know, I've even used like a ground spike, uh, putting a ground spike like a, a one foot long tent peg in the ground with a uh, vertical mounted off of it. And it still was like marginal success. Um, if you got a lot of time to, to be finicky and stuff like that, then I would say go with it. I know uh, uh, Gokan has a Wolf River coil antenna. To me, I'm not, you know, I've got other people's uh, opinions of it. And I actually played with one down in the States and I wasn't overly impressed with it uh, myself, but it might've just been the train I'm on, but uh, you know, verticals, you get really low, if it's a quarter wave, you get really low takeoff angle, which is good, but also to the, you know, there's trade-offs as well, eh? Yeah. The like, other thing is that you've got, mostly in, in our Rockies, uh, you're on limestone, and limestone is a very poor conductor. So half your antenna, by definition, is already missing, and you need that reflection uh, to, to really give you any kind of efficiency if you're on a, uh, a volcanic uh, uh, place where you've got a lot of iron in the ground, it's a different story. Go to Hawaii and something like that. But, uh, and then you've got salt water around you as well. So verticals will work well there. But it's about the worst place you can use a vertical is in our Rockies. I used yeah. one down in Arizona. Um, well, the fellow activator was using it. I actually played with it and checked it out because it was it was new and shiny to me, and I wanted to know if it would be worthwhile. And uh, um, you know, down there, you know, one watt side band can get you contacts type of thing with a with a uh, a dipole. So uh, to me, it was a bit, a big trade off, and I wasn't, you know, it was nice, but I wasn't a hundred percent impressed with it. Of course, you can make these things perform a lot better with a serious radial system. But I mean, you can just picture that uh, picture I showed you at the beginning of mailing on Windy Hill, you know, trying to string out, you know, half a dozen wires on the ground. I mean, forget it. Can't be done. <laughs> if you think about it, most people that use the vertical antennas are using um, like a loading coil, which is inherently lossy and your antenna is short, right? So, I mean, uh, it would be really interesting for, uh, for, for, for Malin to try his NFED halfway vertically on a pole. And uh, <laughs> that way you don't really need much of a radial system, just that little counterpoise. And just how does that play compared to stringing it horizontally? So that, 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 that really is, uh, you know, it's it, at least you're comparing sort of uh, apples to apples, uh, the, the same antenna vertically as it is horizontally. I, I've actually taken my, uh, um, one of my transformers with a short wire, a 33 foot wire. And I had it, uh, it was about a 28 foot pole. So it was near vertical, but I had to keep it out because the, the pole itself was carbon fiber, which interacts with the, uh, with the, um, with the element itself so but it it worked very well just it was trying to get that 28 foot mast to stay upright on a summit is a bit of a uh, a challenge we mentioned earlier that there's several configuration options open for NFED half waves and one of which is like an inverted l i mean you kind of are just running one leg up the pole right so it's it's similar to what peter was saying okay so um Let's quickly talk about loops. Um, loops can be used for soda. I've done it with a, that's the one on the left there is a six meter loop that I've got that I took up last June on uh, the VHF UHF contest, uh, sat up on Buffalo Hill and made some contacts with it. And uh, they're, they're fun to play around with just because they're a different thing. And uh, I'd encourage new hams to uh, read up a, a, about them and, and think about them and, and so on. Uh, they don't tend to be hugely in, in favor as soda things other than as a, let's try it and see once in a while and play uh, because you can see there are issues again similar to the verticals in terms of how do you stand it up uh, but uh, let's just talk about the upside first um, nice small footprint just like a vertical uh, they're low noise that's one of the virtues of loops in the base case right um, and they're quite directional. You can even use them if you orient them a certain way to null out a QRM source or, or help peak a weak signal. And if the thing is sitting on a, on a tripod with a tilt head or something, I mean, you can almost instantly reorient the thing from vertical to horizontal polarization as you switch from SSB to FM and that sort of thing. 
Um, and you can buy them, but they're pretty easy to home brew too. Uh, you can home brew them with nothing much more than, you know, some coax and, and a capacitor and, you know, uh, so it, it's kind of a fun thing to play with, but they are an odd shape to stick in a backpack or, you know, you, uh, you, you can't, I, I've hauled a, my six meter one up, up a soda hill and it wasn't all that easy, but uh, it, it's the shape, if the shape factor is arguably a bigger impediment than the weight. Um, like the verticals, they're a little prone to upset in wind. Uh, and of course, the number one problem, well, maybe I, that I've always found with, uh, with loops is they're just very, very fussy to tune and narrow banded. You kind of need to take your, uh, your nano VNA up on the hilltop with you and, you know, play with it and just get those, that capacitor set just so. And they're just inherently less efficient than a lot of the wire antenna designs that, uh, that we've talked about. Malin, have you done loops much? I've done a couple of loops and I, uh, I found, I put them in the same uh, pile as the, uh, the buddy pole, the buddy stick, um, you know, really super finicky. If you change frequency, you got to retune the loop. And um, I, I, I found out that day I just, basically got my four points and went home. I, I wasn't happy at all. I don't like playing around with antennas up on top of a, a summit. I'd rather just set it up and get it done and, and move on. And it could be a different dynamic in parks on the air, right? I mean, it might be part of the fun is to set up near a picnic table and, and play with tuning and, and all that stuff. It's just a lot depends on what your operating style and preferences are. Did you see that video? I think it's by that Adam, the same guy that made those micro micro coils and micro traps. And he had a he had a loop that was made out of uh, it was kind of folded up like a kind of like a titanium fireplace, but it was a whole bunch of slats. And uh, he had that in a mountaintop. That was kind of a cool design, I thought. So some people have done some very clever things, especially to deal with the shape factor issue. Because like I said, that's its biggest issue with a, with a loop more so than the weight or, and, and so on is just how to make it attachable or, or stuffable. Uh, and, and he's one of the guys that's done, done good work in that regard, which is yes, a loop is still a loop. And, and the kind of things we were just talking about, I think are, are, uh, are with consideration. So I, I play with it on the, con on the VHF UHF contest day, but it's not a, a go-to antenna for routine soda ops, especially in the winter. Mm -hmm. So we're getting near the end here. Uh, thanks to people for being so patient. I thought maybe we should talk a little bit about the commercial options. Uh, Mel and I have shown quite a few homebrew things here. There's some very, very pretty looking kit out there on the internet. And uh, a lot of that stuff offers, according to the ads. If you some... want to go back, Ken, please. Okay. There, uh, further back? No, no, just back to that picture of the five different... Uh... Yep. I've uh, I've uh, played with uh, three of the five pictured. I actually own the bottom right picture one, and I don't use it anymore. That's oh, that's the the alpha antenna. I think uh, uh, forget the name off the top of my head, but the the one the bottom left is the same design. It 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 goes off of a five to one on on which was originally with the uh, CH250 vertical that you can buy for your house, I think by Cushcraft. And the upper right one is by uh, Chameleon Antennas, it uses the same uh, five to one type of design. So it's, uh, and they're all shortened. Um, that, that's the that's the impasse, right? Yeah, yes. I think. So these things have fabulous capability in some ways. They can typically hire, uh, handle a lot of power. They typically offer lots and lots of bands, uh, including the lower bands than 40 meters by using, you know, loading coils and traps and things. Uh, a lot of these things come with kit and accessories for different configuration options, the inverted V or L, sloper, vertical, etc. They're made of strong durable materials and come with their own uh, high fashion uh, field packs and accessories which you, you can see there so you know you can see how they they get people drooling but this is the downside 
they are typically heavier and bulkier by having all those loading coils and traps and stands the, and they're they they really go towards a um a certain group almost like a uh, tech preppers or the or the uh MCOM preppers type of thing uh they do work um but ken's right like you know expensive like 600 dollars us you can almost buy a hf uh, radio for that you can get so, a used 817 for that now are there any uh, military surplus uh sources what um not that i know if i i've i have a military surplus uh whip from the old 77 set which is uh, i think about nine and a half ten feet tall the falls down is uh I think it's brass or bronze anyways it's uh it's fairly heavy and uh it it does work well if you're yeah. in the right type of environment yeah. haven't seen a lot on the market there there's a few guys that like to use green radios as they're called uh just kind of as a as a fun thing like being into vinyl records you know but uh you don't see a lot of them so not to slag anybody that's that's got gear like this i mean i I, I'm drooling in some ways and for things like where you're not necessarily hiking up a mountain with a backpack, but you know, somewhere like a poda or whatever, you could probably set up in a park and work everything from 160 to, you know, two meters, like with one antenna and, and that's awesome. But we just don't, you know, to haul up a soda hill here, they're just not practical. There's been a, a debate I've heard um, quite some time ago about whether or not it's better to be on a very pointy hill for working HF or a very flat topped hill. Have you found any differences there or is just more important than the conditions at the time? I would say I think, the latter. <laughs> I, I think height is might and really comes in true. Um, even with uh, VHF, you know, I've, I've had, you know, 270 kilometer contacts with an HT with an external antenna. But, but height doesn't necessarily talk about the pointiness aspect. Like there's hills like Mount Minos, that's basically a plateau or Plateau Mountain, which is called Plateau Mountain because you know you get up there and it's flat, but uh, for you know a long, long way. But as long as you got the absolute height, um, it, it seems to work pretty much the same. I haven't noticed a big difference as to whether we're on a narrow ridge or not, male of you. Um, I, I really can't. Notice, I know the one time uh, last June I was up on Table Mountain down in the uh, Castle Park and, and it was a sudden blizzard and my mask fell over and I didn't know it. So my my uh, infant was laying on the ground and I was still making contacts. Yeah, so height that's... makes such a difference. And that's one of the joys of soda that I think I've talked to this group about before. You're there with like, you know, uh, even with an amplifier, I maxed out at 40 watts. But because of the height advantage and because you're away from all that urban RF noise, you're talking to this guy in New Zealand like he was next door. It's insane. There was, a, there was a, some kind of an article I read about this fellow was using a, a vertical and he would go just uh, slightly down from the, uh, from the edge, you know, the maximum height of where he was and uh, like 10% down the hill. And in that direction, he had one honking signal off uh, you know, in the direction of the uh, of the fall away of the hill. So kind of interesting, but uh, of course with soda, you want to be right at the top. Well, in theory, well, you could use the hill, I guess, as sort of a directive device. It's like, yeah. a, like a passive Yagi or something, but uh, we are limited as we, we talked earlier to that 25 vertical meter rule. You often don't operate right at the summit though, because other people want to be there. Like on Prairie, or on, uh, Prairie Mountain, we usually set up just a little bit downhill just as a courtesy, you know, because everybody wants to take selfies by the flag. Have you, you ever know? tried tried a kite as to fly a kite for an antenna? I haven't. It's been done for soda. Malin, have you done that? I that's what that's on my uh, to-do list, but I haven't uh, done it yet. I I I'm not sure what I'm gonna use for an antenna. Maybe it most likely an infid, but uh, I'm not sure yet. I would say that one's probably better for islands on the air. You want something like the trade winds where it's a nice steady blow. The problem with Alberta, right, is if the wind, it's almost always gusting. And that's just deadly for kites. 
sounds like the loss would be about the same as losing your uh, your Leatherman every five minutes. <laughs> That's true. It could be a sacrificial item. All right, so we should just kind of move this on to the conclusion and let any other questions come out. Obviously, as you the wavelengths get shorter and, and so on, uh, other options open up. Various design types that don't work that well, you know, for 20 meters at a, on a soda hill become perfectly viable at 70 centimeters or up, right? So Yaggies, Moxons, Quads, Log Periodics, Double Zep, Patch, Slot, Helical, like you go on and on. And it's been done. The picture on the right there is an, a, an assembly that VE6 IXD took up there on, I think it was probably Square Butte for one of those VHF contests. And he had a, a about two or three antennas all set up and it's kind of an array there and was trying all kinds of different bands and having a great time. On the left there, there's a picture just of a, of a 70 centimeter Yagi just hanging again from a soda pole. Um, and uh, I thought you'd be interested in the picture in the middle. This is a home brewed setup uh, that VE6 IXD has made for a six centimeter video. So this is full motion FPV color video that you see on your cell phone. And you do the, uh, the QSO by holding up uh, a little uh, recipe card with your call sign written on it. And there's two little helical antennas there that he got uh, built uh, by a, out of plastic on a, on a 3D printer and, and wound them and uh, just bought drone kit. The camera is basically from the drone world off, you know, eBay and, uh, and uh, so is the, uh, the transmitter, a very tiny, light little things just strapped to a board and the cell phone is the computer. And uh, we've uh, talked to each other uh, mountaintop to mountaintop on this, this kit several times. So uh, a bunch of real interesting antenna possibilities uh, happen as you go up in frequency. So that's kind of what we've been branching out into more recently besides the HF stuff is playing with, uh, with higher bands. I've talked to Malin a couple of times now on 1296 megahertz. He's been up on Windy Hill and places like that. And I've uh, talked to him from home and it's been good fun. There's some more pictures. Malin, you want to talk about those ones? You, those are all home brews that you did too. The, those are, uh, two are extended double zep for two meters. Uh, extended double zep for two meters is basically a five quarter wave antenna. A five quarter wave dipole, uh, I guess you want to call it with a with a matching snub in the center, center fed. The picture on the left actually is uh, one I made for a guy down in Arizona that has a YouTube channel. So he it might be on a video shortly because he just received it today. It's made from arrow shafts. Uh, the upper right one that's a wire that that's the one out of my pack. That antenna weighs one ounce. You just put a two meters of RG58 on it, and it works very well. Uh, the extended double ZEP has a, a three dBD gain, so it is a gain antenna um, compared to a J-pole and others that are just basically a half wave antenna. The center one and the bottom pictures are the same thing as a two element, uh, two meter Yagi made from uh, one inch square aluminum tubing and uh, um, aluminum TIG rods with using uh, just connectors and put it all together. It works very well as, as well. Home brewing VHF antennas can be a lot of fun. It's a lot cheaper than HF because you don't have all of the you know long wires and stuff like that. And it's a small footprint. So um, that's that's why I said now that top antenna on a I think it was an 18-foot mast on jumping pound the one ridge over soda ridge over west of Bray Creek, I was talking to a mobile down by Milk River two years ago. So it's capable of long distance. So that's something to keep in mind. Even if you, you know, if you want to start making like a tape measure Yagi, they're fun to make as well. Very cheap to make. So we should just uh, almost uh, at the end here now, just a quick word about feed lines. Um, I think because uh, Jerry, you had asked me to comment on that. And it wasn't in the earlier draft of the, the presentation. Like, what do we use for feed lines? Do we have to use the exotic, you know, high dollar coaxes that are out there? And the answer is generally no. Uh, but of course, some of the designs we talked about before use have you need a longer feed line, like with an inverted V dipole, than that little six footer at the low end of an N fed half wave. 
but you know we use your regular you know el cheapo stuff we use some good stuff too but uh um malin can you add to that what what do you use uh my favorite is rg uh rg58 overall for hf and for uh, v, uh, vhf um i use like i always have like two meter uh with bnc connectors in my pack um when i go into if i use a dipole i generally speaking try to use rg58 as well because if i'm using a dipole i want it for performance i want to get it as much um every watt out type of thing and not any losses in the system uh, if you get into VHF, the losses, you know, they increase very, you know, very fast. So that's what I use. I have 174 here, like a good quality 174, but I rarely use it at all anymore. So that just, uh, you know, don't need any uh, high dollar stuff again here. We do a lot of soda stuff with homebrewed antennas and, you know, your basic uh, Radio World RG58 kind of uh, feed line and, and away you go. But uh, sometimes, yeah, you have to invest a bit more like uh, at the uh, at microwave, you, uh, you're you gonna have to get something pretty beefy. I tried RG58 just a week ago or uh, on the, uh, the winter uh, VHF UHF contest. I was trying to run uh, 23 centimeters uh, from up on top of uh, Square Butte. And I had to put the uh, Yagi up on top of a soda pole in order to get the line of sight to Calgary. But I wasn't doing very well. And when I came back and did the math, you know, on the loss coefficients and all that, it's like I was losing 75% of the power going up the feed line. So when I do when I do 23 centimeters, I have about maybe at the most three feet of uh, RG58. Um, most of the time it's like, you know, maybe 16, 18 inches at, of uh, RG58. And I have to stand there, hold hold the radio and the, and the uh the yag at the same time and maybe look for a piece of uh rg316 there mailing uh you know for that short length because that's uh that's teflon it's pretty good stuff little lower loss yeah i have um, some rg316 that i've got my uh my 23 centimeter transverter connected to the uh to the amplifier with but what i haven't yet got is that to run up a soda pole and that was what was killing me but it is I great stuff I, I've tried it, but I find the RG50, you want something as rugged as well, because this gets tossed in my pack. The 316 is a little bit too, uh, in my books, a little bit too delicate. And it's, and it's, and it's, I found it to, you know, be more lossier than a short chunk of RG58. Yeah, yeah. I made a, uh, a 30 meter uh, zip cord dipole. Um, and, uh, you know, and could fold back the ends to 20 meters and ran that off the KX3 with a, uh, with the uh, fiberglass pole. And it worked really quite well. And I don't think the losses were very high in, uh, in uh, 20, 30 feet of zip cord. So, yeah. So that's all the slides. Uh, took longer than I thought. So I apologize if we've added to the uh, folklore that says that the third or fourth Monday in January is the most depressing day of the year. Hopefully you, you got something worthwhile out of this presentation um, and we'll open it up for some more questions here as long as uh, uh, Jerry says we got time. Uh, so uh, with thanks uh, for you being such an attentive audience uh, from us, us soda guys, you got two of the three Alberta goats here. And I really wanna thank Malin for uh, coming along and adding his expertise uh, to, uh, to, to round this out. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over for questions. First of all, I wanna thank you both for, for a wonderful presentation. And if you're like me, you might think of the question after this is over. So just keep in mind, we have the groups IO, uh, feel free to post questions there. Um, and and uh, I'm sure that uh, Ken you know, regularly checks in uh, to these uh, sessions, uh, mail in hopefully as well. Uh, so we'll be back to, uh, you know, next month, hopefully answer some questions that come up. In